Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be the person to say welcome to everyone here. What a great crowd. I think right here in this room, we have the most important people in the state of Colorado. And what a beautiful place to have this annual conference. The Denver Art Museum is a gym for the entire state of Colorado. Before you leave today, for goodness sakes, if you like flowers, go see this magnificent exhi exhibit called In Bloom. It's right across the bridge over in the other building. Okay, CCMU is alive and well. I'm happy to report that we have had a wonderful year. A very special word of recognition came to CCMU this month. Bruce Dabosky, writing in the Denver Post, and representing the Colorado Philanthropic Advisor Network announced that CCMU was the nonprofit organization of the month. Wow. For many, uh, this is what the uh, Announcement says, for many Coloradans, the barriers to quality health care are too great. The Colorado Coalition for the Medically Underserved has been breaking down these barriers since 1998. CCMU, through award-winning educational initiatives, balanced policy advocacy, and authentic community engagement, works to increase access to health insurance and health care and makes our health care system more equitable, seamless, and effective so it meets the needs of all Coloradans. Thank you, thank you, Bruce, for this recognition. Well, why are we here today? We're here today to get educated. And so we have brought an outstanding keynote speaker. He is Thomas Goetz, who believes in innovation and in empowering patients. He also knows very well just how hard both of these are to do successfully. It's much easier to think and talk about how we must innovate in healthcare and how we must get better at engaging patients in their own health and in changing the healthcare system than it is to actually turn that passion into a product. But with an extensive list of accomplishment, it is clear that Thomas is much more than just a great thinker. That's why we have brought him to Colorado today. Because CCMU, like CCMU, he is all about doing, accomplishment, changing the world. Thomas is a writer, an entrepreneur, and digital health expert. His 2010 TED Talk has been seen by more than a half a million people, and his two books, The Remedy and The Decision Tree, have received many honors. He was previously editor of Wired and served as the first entrepreneur in residence for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. There, he created Flip the Clinic. Most recently, he is co-founder and CEO 
of Iodine, a healthcare technology company that's leveraging data to help people make better decisions about their health. I'm told that he also plays the cello and is a juggler. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a renaissance man with us today. We're thrilled to have him here today, and we can't wait to hear the new ideas he's brought to share with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Thomas Getz. Well, thank you. That was quite an introduction. Um, he's like that every year, right? I, I was warned. Um, so yeah, so I do, I do play the cello, and I don't know how you learned about the juggling. It, it turns out, juggling, so I went, when I went to college, I was required to take gym credits, who had that requirement at their college, so I had that. And so just to be clear, I played intramural Ultimate Frisbee, but they didn't give gym credits for Ultimate Frisbee. Um, so that I had to take these other classes, and so I took, you know where this is going, don't you? So I had to take, um, I took swimming lessons, which I was already a proficient swimmer, but I got a little better. And then I took CPR, and I got a gym credit, and then I ended up taking juggling for gym credit. So, so yes, at one point I could juggle five balls, um, but now I'm back down to three. So, um, it's a, it's a great honor to be here today. Um, and I've had some great conversations with uh, Joe and Sarah and the, and the team at CCMU. It's, it's been greatly impressive to see what is happening uh, here through this organization, this organization that has done so much in what, a dozen, 13, 14 years, something like that? Um, and the impact it's had, and obviously I've always, always known that Colorado is a leader in health, um, I grew up in Minneapolis, um, and there was always a rivalry, in, at least in my head. I came from a family of healthcare practitioners, and so there was always a rivalry between Minnesota, which prided itself on being a bastion of health and had some good um, demographic numbers on health. And then, but there was this other state on the maps that always seemed to be really good at population health, and it was Colorado. Um, so, so I'm glad to be here and to participate um, and be really in the hub. Of, of the people who are making that happen every day. Uh, and I know that many of the people here, um, in fact, I know a, a couple of you, and I was um, glad to see you, and, and the, the quality of, of um, thinking and the quality of work that you all do in technology and in healthcare is, is I know, world class. So you will have to allow me um, to be sharing ideas that many of them, you, you, I'm, not, I'm not offering them as new ideas. I do not presume that I'm arriving to tell you anything you don't always already know. But, uh, but I find, and as you'll, you'll see, my, my hope is that the more we share ideas and talk about the same things again and again, that's kind of when new ways of thinking about those old ideas can emerge. So, so let's see what happens. Um, so I want to start uh, today by talking about one of my favorite illustrations of, of kind of the challenge of healthcare and the challenge of serving um, people in our communities. The difference between what we think medicine should be and the reality of what healthcare is. And it's this story that um, one of my professors at, at Berkeley, um, I, I got my master's of public health um, relatively recently, and Len Syme, a, a great um, kind of pioneer of behavioral health, uh, had this story about San Francisco bus drivers, and it's one of my favorite stories. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to tell it quickly here. So, so they realized that there was a great um, uh, elevated rash of, of hypertension, high blood pressure in bus drivers in San Francisco. In fact, it was about 90% of bus drivers in San Francisco had high blood pressure. So they thought, okay, well, let's do a, a kind of good public health intervention and, and target these, this population and see if we can help them. Well, it turned out that, that as they started to work with them, they realized that it wasn't just high blood pressure, they also had low back pain, uh, gastrointestinal issues, there was, there was high levels of alcoholism. And so they, they expanded the programs, got more research money, and started to treat for those conditions. And then they realized that, that 
even when they were going kind of further, further upstream, they were still having some problems because they could treat the older drivers for these conditions, the ones who were already kind of had the jobs and were in the system, but the new drivers would come along, and they were soon developing, and this was, this was a project that took many years to, to unfold, but they, they started to realize that the new drivers were being exposed and kind of having the same health uh, issues arise. So they realized that this wasn't just kind of a, a coincidence. It was, in fact, the job itself that was, in some sense, causing this, these ailments. So they figured, okay, well, what can we do about the job? Well, they started to try to understand what it was about the job. And what they realized was that it was the, um, the way that the driver's schedule was created was that the, they would go out and they would just map kind of one from, from point A to point B and point B to point C, and they, they would drive it in a passenger car. Uh, and that was how they dictated how many minutes the drivers would have to get from point to point. Well, of course, if you've ever been, in, as you look at the uh, buses around Denver, that isn't how public buses work, right? They don't go quite as fast as the rest of traffic. And so it turned out that the drivers were always behind schedule, and they could never hit the schedule that, that they were on, on, uh, assigned. And in fact, that the reason the schedule was like that was because it was, it was created by a computer, um, and they couldn't actually figure out a way to, um, to shift it without taking their breaks. And, and basically, the drivers would have to sacrifice their breaks in order to keep on schedule. And so when they needed to eat, they wouldn't be able to kind of bring out their, their lunch from home. They'd have to go to McDonald's and dash in and grab fast food and come back out, and, and so on and so forth. And when they were done with the day, they were exhausted. And so they would end up at the local bar um, near the bus stations. And so this is what happened. And so when they started to work with the, the management of the um, bus system in San Francisco, um, is this story interesting so far? I love this story. So either you're with me or you're not. So, you're, um, so when they started working with the management, they realized that there was a pro the problem was that the management was, was in some sense unsympathetic to the drivers, in part for two reasons. One, because many of those management had been drivers themselves and had been there, and they had to go through the same stuff. And so if they did it, why can't these new guys? And the other reason was because these drivers were always calling in sick. And so one-third of the budget was being spent on very expensive replacement drivers. And so the management resented the drivers for always being sick and kind of, you know, this suspicion of whether they were actually sick or not. So this was the problem, right? It wasn't hypertension. It was this whole system. It was this whole apparatus that, that went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And in fact, if you want to spin it out, it looked like this. Um, is this readable? Is that too high for people? Okay. So, so this is the problem, this to me is the microcosm of all the problems that we face in health. Many, many people think of, of health as a, as a uh, or medicine as a scientific problem. We need to have new discoveries. We need to put more money into the National Institute of Health. I don't believe it's that way at all. I believe that the, the actual things that have moved the needle in healthcare are, are largely in the realm of public health. Um, we were talking about fluoride earlier, which being a, a huge one, and I'm go for, wait, yay for Denver for, for keeping fluoride in the water. Who knew that was a radical idea? Um, but the way, the way we start to unpack these problems, when I think about these and I hear these stories, I start to think that this is not just a small problem, this is a problem of civilization itself, right? So in some ways, we have created this edifice that we call civilization, this, this kind of wonderful, these wonderful cities and, and temples to our success, but they also are the things that are on the street corners, and they, they um, in effect, have us having to reverse engineer, or, or what a, a, a TV broadcaster would say is counter-programming against civilization, which means counter-programming is when, is when you, know, you know that there's one kind of love boat is on TV, sorry for the reference. Um, I, I don't know why that's what came into my head, but uh, Fantasy Island's on TV, and so you need to program something else that is, that is equally appealing against it, right? So that's counter-programming. Well, that's the task of healthcare and public health and medicine is to counter-program against this little thing we call civilization itself. So how do we do that? Well, we can do it this way. We can put up billboards that try to counter-program point by point, um, but that's a hard road to hoe. That's going to take a lot of effort. Um, and in fact, when you think about some of the, um, 
Some of the other attempts to do this, like, like the great, one of the greatest successes that we've had as a, as a country and as a civilization to counter-program against civilization was tobacco control. Well, it didn't just take us to find the science that tobacco was bad for our health, right? We learned that and proved that definitively in 1963. Um, it took 30 years of subsequent work, policy work, changing the tax code, um, changing the labeling on cigarettes, changing the marketing that was allowed around cigarettes, and finding marketing that was equally compelling to go the other way. Finding something, we were talking about this earlier, finding something like the dangers of secondhand smoke to actually give people who are non-smokers a, a kind of stake in the game. It took this series of changes that were, in, in essence, building up a, a monolithic presence that was so strong that it could actually enter the debate and counter-program against that little thing called smoking. So that's what it takes to accomplish things in health and public health, big things. And that's what the Colorado Coalition is doing. That's what, that's what so many of us in this room are, are tasked with. So, so if you aren't thinking of your jobs in, on this scale, I encourage you to, to grasp the, the larger goal that we all share. So, but it's also more intimidating. So how do we do that? Well, I would, I would venture today, and I want to I wanna kind of unfold some ideas, that this has traditionally been an analog problem, right? That bus driver, uh, that bus driver story is all about these kind of analog problems, except for the computer that held the schedule. This was a kind of human problem. It was a problem of, of people understanding sympathy, empathy, um, human relationships. Tobacco, this was, this was all analog. These were, these were very heavy lifts, every part of this. Um, these were, it's, it's not a coincidence that this, the tobacco stuff happened right before really the dawn of the World Wide Web. So, so how could we tackle these problems? How could we tackle these things with the aid of digital technologies, with the aid of healthcare, or with the aid of, of uh, at the aid of healthcare? And I would offer this as, as a, a phrase that um, a friend of mine actually used, um, Sean Duffy at Omada Health. He, he had this phrase, the analog divide. So everybody here is familiar with the, the phrase digital divide? You're, I see, a, who's not? Okay, everybody knows what the digital divide is. This idea that, that people have, and this, this really came up in the late 90s, the idea that some people have access to the internet and technology and some people don't. By and large, the digital divide has, has gone away, which is what happens with technology, it becomes cheaper and more accessible to more people. Um, that isn't to say that, that there aren't some people who have less access, but, but by and large, if is largely on, by virtue of mobile phones and, and cellular technologies, we are now able to effectively reach 90, 95% of the population via um, digital technologies. So that's, I'm not gonna say it's taken care of, but it is not the grave issue we thought it was. There is, however, a, an analog divide which is the one that, that I think many of you are, are uh, tasked with, with tackling, but you may not think about it this way, but it is access to resources. It is, pro it is getting to the clinic. It is getting on that bus. It is finding time to take an hour for the bus ride instead of 15 minutes in the car. Those are the hurdles, the very analog hurdles of daily life that I think are in many ways keeping us from that ideal version or a closer, uh, getting closer to the ideal version of good health and good health care. So technology, I think, can help us bridge that analog divide. And that's what I want to talk about today. And, and really because this, the, the, op the opportunity is to, to target um, and to see as the, the real, um, in some sense, the key users of these technologies are those people who are most vulnerable and have the least access or the least access to care. Um, this is not because we should go after them um, out of duty, but in, in uh, the argument I'd like to make is that they are the best market to go after on a business sense. Um, they're the biggest population. So if you, can, if you can respond to their needs and respond to the needs of people who are at the far end of this analog divide, if you can make their lives easier, then you probably are reaching a lot more people along the way. All right, so I want to offer three kind of uh, uh, principles or, or tricks or strategies for, for going after that. Uh, oh, well, before I get to those, I want to make one kind of philosophical um, point. I believe, uh, I believe in this. This is, this is kind of important for me just to get on the table. I believe in these two things. I believe that um, we have the capacity 
uh, to use technology and design to make complicated decisions easier to understand, right? That isn't to say that the technology makes it easy to make the decision, but that at least technology and design can, can create a, a, um, an experience, a user experience that makes that complexity a little more simple and a little more graspable for the ordinary person. So who disagrees with that? Who, I'm not saying that these are easy problems, but I'm saying that technology and design are, in some sense, the best tools we have to make complicated things easier. If you disagree, you disagree? OK, thank you. Um, the second thing I, I believe in, philosophically, is that people, ordinary people, have the capacity to make good decisions. Um, that when they are given the tools and the opportunity and the opportunity for input, that they can make good decisions on their own behalf. So to me, that's a core principle. If you don't, that isn't to say that, that they can handle the most complicated situations, that, that none of us are, are, or each of us is, in some sense, um, can always be overwhelmed. We can always be overwhelmed by the complexity or the gravity of a decision. But we still have the capacity to make a good decision if, if we structure it correctly. All right, so that is the, the philosophy that I want to um, argue from and go on to offer these three principles um, that, that kind of would, would leverage that kind of uh, thinking or philosophy. The first is to measure the mess. So the mess is what that, those bus drivers were in, right? It wasn't simply a matter of getting them to take a drug. It was understanding the complexity, the messiness of their lives, the messiness of the environment in which they lived um, their, their daily lives and had to try to accomplish their, their jobs. Um, it was a mess, and life is a mess, and medicine is a mess. Healthcare is a mess. That's the reality, right? We like to measure it, we like to validate it, we like to kind of test it in clinical environments, um, in randomized controlled trials. They're lovely things, but they're artificial for a reason, because the life is too messy. And I think now, importantly, we are at the opportunity where we can start to move into the mess and not have to, in essence, replicate a synthetic environment, but actually measure the reality. And measuring the reality is more powerful because there's more data there. That's where more variety of human experience lies. And that is more closely tied to the impact we're trying to have. So that's all somewhat vague. Um, so let me be specific. Uh, well, there, there's this thing. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who knows what each of these things stands for? Nobody? Really? Okay, let's, let's shout it out. ACA, QHP, QRS, Quality Rating System, I heard everybody say, uh, and QIS, Quality Improvement Strategy, yes, and CMS. Right, you guys all get an A. Um, so, so this is starting to measure the mess. The, this list of acronyms. So the ACA is driving all these quality measures that are trying to start, in, 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 and I, I think I, it's, it captures a lot of people, people's breath. Like it's taking people's breath away how fast these quality measures, we knew quality was part of it, but it is, it is hitting. It is hitting reality, it is hitting practices, it is hitting organizations. This year, next year even more so, it's, it's changing the dynamics of healthcare because people are starting to measure the mess. Patient reported outcomes or patient reported experience or what we might even think of calling person reported experience um, because it's not just the outcome and it's not just the patient, it's everything that happens in between, that's where the mess is. Those are starting to become validated and important and bottom line measures. So that's, that's causing us to measure the mess from the top down, right? So that's a huge shift. And I don't think we can, we can underscore the importance of how quickly these things are, are working their way into the system. But there are also some important things from the bottom up, and these are kind of the, I want to offer a couple examples. Many of you probably have heard of these, but Propeller Health is one of my favorite examples of measuring the mess in, in a kind of bottom up world. This is a very clever company out of um, Madison, Wisconsin. They started as uh, being called Asmopolis. And Asmopolis was, um, uh, what they figured out is that they could attach sensors to people's asthma inhalers and out of that create a map and a data set out of what are people actually experiencing and where. 
and that is creating a new intelligence to the reality of dealing with asthma and now um, uh, COPD. So, OCPD, um, whatever that is, I may have messed it up. Um, COPD, right? Yeah, thank you. So, so this is a fantastic company that is, that is finding a way to turn the mess into better informed, better and in, more, more powerful action for real people in their real lives. And I think I, I can't give enough credit and, and insist upon how important these things are. My company, Iodine, is trying to do this uh, similarly, and I, I want to make this quick, but we're trying to measure the mess of people onboarding to antidepressants. We're trying to understand what, because antidepressants turns out have a 50% failure rate and 50% uh, of people end up quitting them. And so you, when you start one, odds are it's probably not gonna work for you. So you wanna get people understanding what they're going through and get them back to the doctor as fast as possible. So we're trying to measure the messiness of their lives, get them back to the doctor so they can try something else. And hopefully learn from what wasn't working the first time to make that next choice even more optimal. So that's a way that we're trying to measure the mess. Um, this is, I think, a principle and an opportunity that, that all of us can start to embrace. The second idea is to design for the end user, right? So this is a, a core principle of user experience. It's been around for 20, 30 years, but it's just coming to healthcare. And I think the, the way we need to think about this is who is the end user? And it's a big shift that is still taking place in healthcare. Too often, the end user has been the person with a paycheck or uh, with a, with a um, checkbook, uh, the person paying the bill and not the patient or the person. So what happens when you do that is this. This is my lovely patient portal. I have re redacted the name of my insurer for their protection. Um, but who is this designed for? Like, what does this do? What am I supposed to do with this? There's all sorts of little things, including Disney's Habit Heroes, which is wonderful to see. But like, how do I, how does this make me in anywhere care about my health? How does this change the, the like, dollars to donuts, anybody going to a patient portal probably has fear, uncertainty, or doubt in mind, right? So you don't really grapple with your healthcare until you have to, and then you come here, and oh boy, I feel so much better. So, so <laughs> that doesn't work. That is not designed for the end user. Um, that is starting to change. Some of you in this room are starting to change it. Um, we are all starting to change it by thinking about what the end user actually could use. So this is a, um, a, a prototype uh, developed by a fellow named Julian Pierre, or Perrier, um, and this was a reimagination. As you can see, it's called Fantasy Health, um, so, so that's appropriate. Um, but it's actually orienting, right? It is quite literally orienting the experience around where the patient would exist or, or lives. Um, and then we have this beefcake doctor that you can go to. Um, uh, he gets five stars. And importantly, look down below, he is very supportive, right? These are, these are, these are things that matter to the patient. Um, some people like supportive doctors. Some people like, like doctors who are know-it-all doctors. We all have our different preferences. Um, but this lets us tailor our experience according to our own preferences, right? That's, that's understanding what the end user wants, understanding that different people have different needs. That's what we need to do in medicine um, and in healthcare. And I'm gonna click along here. Um, the third thing, um, oh, oh, actually, well, I just wanna make one more point on, the, on the, um, the, think of the end user. We have to think about healthcare, not as something that people come to because they have to, but something that they want to use. Think about that. Think about how radical that would be if, if healthcare services were things people actually wanted to use, that they chose to do, chose to participate in, instead of playing video games, instead of watching TV, instead of going to McDonald's, that they actually chose it because it made them happy. That's amazing. That would be amazing. So the third thing I want to talk about is forking the code. Does anybody know what I mean by this? Thank you. So in software, um, open source software in particular, um, there is a, a really a, a, a dramatic shift in software over the last um, 15 years towards open source software where you make code, you develop a, a piece of software, and you make it available to other people, right? So it's free. Um, sometimes there's a slight charge, but largely it's, it's free. And uh, places like GitHub and SourceForge have emerged to be hubs where people can share their code. And what's remarkable is 
Facebook is sharing their code, Google is sharing their code, people who, who solve problems internally, companies that solve major problems internally, then share that code freely for other companies to use and adopt and adapt. And when they adapt it, when they take that code and use it for their own purposes, it's called forking the code, right? So they, they fork it, take it in a different direction to serve their own purposes and needs. And this is something that healthcare really could do a lot better about. Because forking the code means taking what is useful and been proven and validated in one context and adapting it to another one. And how often does that happen in healthcare? Too often we're stuck in pilot projects and in trials and in, yes, the research is published there, but we have to validate it again over here and that's gonna take a year or two years or three years and we never get around to taking what has worked elsewhere and putting it into effect. And it, it drives me batty. Um, and I believe in validation, I believe in, in clinical validity, but we could use, we could make more progress and we could go faster if we thought about forking what has worked elsewhere instead of having to invent everything from the ground up. So an example of this, a great example is Omada Health. Um, they have taken the diabetes prevention program, which is a validated piece of, of massive public research, um, and they turned it into largely a software program. They turned it into an algorithm by which people could um, enter a program that's largely app-based, um, but it also has some human contact when necessary, and it leads people through a, a, a basically a, an obesity and diabetes prevention program, and it works because they took a kind of very high-touch, validated piece of academic research and turned it into software. And that is an effective way to scale ideas. It's an effective way to, to fork code. Um, similarly, there's a couple another examples. There's, there's the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, where I've been affiliated, just launched this program with UCSF called Evidence for Action. And it is designed as a hub, a uh, clearinghouse, really, for good public health interventions that have evidence behind them so that people are able to share and build um, meaningful change in their communities based on evidence. Uh, it's, it's an important change in, in the philosophy. It's not, just, it's not just the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which spends $500 million a year in health research. They're actually putting that towards, nobody's eating, I'm realizing now. Lord, I, I'll stop in a second. Um, they're putting it to dissemination of evidence, and that's an important change. Not just funding new research, but funding dissemination of, of previous research. And that's, what, um, that's one of the principles behind this, this uh, project that I kicked off called Flip the Clinic, which is trying to flip the idea, the trip, flip the relationship between doctors and providers, or doctors and patients, providers and patients, really, not just doctors, um, and, and try to bring more efficiency and more, um, more joy, in some sense, to the primary care experience, um, which is such a bottleneck right now for, for where patients are trying to get care. Um, how can we flip that? And so what we have done is really think of it as, as doing two things. One, it is a, a area to disseminate what works. So it's, a, it's kind of developed on a GitHub model where there's, there's a list of 50 or 60 innovations that have worked places and kind of breaks them down so you can implement them in your facilities or um, practices or clinics. But it's also a way to creatively give people permission to try something that has worked. And that's incredibly important is just giving people permission in healthcare to say, you can try something different. You can try to bring what has worked someplace else to our institution or organization. That there's not enough permission granted in healthcare. And I believe, I believe this room can start to become vessels and, and kind of channels of permission. Um, the interesting thing about Flip the Clinic is that it's always been, often been, the least resourced uh, institutions and clinics that have been the most creative in these uh, environments. Oh, I should say we're doing a national summit in Denver in November um, the, with Flip the Clinic. But it's the, it's the most constrained with resources. It's the ones who are serving the most underserved that have been most creative, which was not what we expected. We expected kind of the Mayo clinics to come along with their fancy um, innovation centers. And uh, they have arrived and they have, they have participated and it's been great. But often it's the scrappiest uh, places that have created the most dynamic interventions. So I'm going to leave with one example of that. This is the Southeast Health Center in um, San Francisco, not far from where um, those buses are parked uh, at the end of the shift. And this, um, this is a great example of, of a kind of all these three principles coming to, coming to roost. Uh, the head of the Southeast Health Center is a fellow named uh, Dr. Keith Seidel. And he went to an Apple store 
and was inspired by how they helped people at the Apple Store. And he had a clinic that had, you know, was miles, leagues away from an Apple Store. Um, they had a backlog. It took, it took I think, uh, 99 days to get the third visit, which is a standard um, arbiter of efficiency of care. Um, and they had people just waiting and frustrated. And they, they felt understaffed, under-resourced. It was a classic disadvantaged clinic in a disadvantaged neighborhood. He went to that Apple store and he was inspired and he flipped it around. He took the nurses from behind the, um, behind the waiting room and he put them in the front. They started to meet the patients as they came in. He took the appointment book and he changed it to 50% appointments to, or from 100% appointments to 50% appointments, 50% walk-in. So people could be moved rapidly in, if they just showed up, they could be moved in and actually get a, 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 an appointment. After a few months of this, they got the point of time from when somebody walked in the clinic to being in an in a actual um, examination room to four minutes. Um, it is a remarkable testament to the power of thinking differently, so to speak, um, and the power of not accepting the status quo. Um, I'm excited about it, not just because it was kind of part of this flip the clinic process. I don't take credit for it, but it was great to be, to be a witness to it. Um, but because this is what is possible. It's possible to have people who have, in some sense, the least incentive or the least opportunity to do something dynamic, and they're doing it. And they're doing it because they're thinking about what is possible, and they're not standing for the status quo. And I think that is what really has shifted. Um, you see it in the ACA, you see it in communities. People feel that there is a change and an opportunity in healthcare like there never has been. And I'm thrilled to be part of that um, day to day. I, I'm sure all of you, I hope, are inspired and thrilled to be part of it. And I can't wait to see um, what happens in Colorado and what happens nationwide over the next few years. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Thomas. My name is Joe Sam, and I'm executive director here at CCMU. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I've always wanted to do that. I don't know why it worked out. All right, so we have about 15 minutes now to um, have a good conversation here with Thomas. Um, our staff and our office has been buzzing ever since we heard the news that Thomas was going to be here today. So um, I think you can tell why it was such a dynamic talk. I'm going to kick us off with, a, with the first question, um, and then we'll open it up to the crowd for a few questions. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious, Thomas, if you could talk about, I love this concept of counter-programming counter civilization. What's the role of a patient or individuals in, in society in being part of that counter-programming? Uh, well, that's a great question. So, so I, I mean, the reason I started to think about it in that the mo most intimidating way, like counter-programming civilization, was because it seems so daunting. And I, I think it's important for us to for, for everyone in, in healthcare and medicine to, to, in some sense, recognize the scale of the problem, but also you know, recognize how, um, how that's what we've chosen, right? It's, a, it's like it's a, it's a calling, right? No matter what, if you're an administrator, if you're a hospital administrator, are there any hospital administrators here? You're, you're, oh yes, of course. You're part of the solution. People don't often think of you maybe as a part of the solution, but you are. Um, no, I'm just being flippant, but I think the, the idea is that there is, there is so much um, opportunity to do things, but it takes a lot to move the needle. And, and so there are, um, I think that's what, what I was trying to get at, was there's a lot of stuff happening top down, right? There's a lot of organizational, systemic, federal change, but people expect more. People expect, I mean, people for two reasons, I think. One, they, they, um, they, ex they, they have seen every industry transform. And people think that there, there's some kind of healthcare exceptionalism or medical exceptionalism where, where um, healthcare is different and doesn't play by the ordinary rules. That is not true. Um, it's slower, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not somehow excluded from ordinary economic forces. And that is the second point, which is that people, ordinary people, are starting to have to pay out of their dollars. So high deductible plans have gone from 30, from 3% of plans to about 25% of people now have them. It's probably even higher um, at the end of this year. So people are exposed to the bottom line and that is forcing them to act like consumers. And then they want to have 
value for their dollar, and they want to, they have expectations. And, and that's, that is, I think, as, that's a, that's a, that's a stick for, for healthcare, but there are, there's reasons to create carrots as well. All right, let's open it up to questions. Denise has a, a microphone in the back. John can, can kick us off. I'm sorry for picking on you. Turn about as well, life. since you did choose to pick on me, um, besides being a hospital administrator, I also have two, two rural health clinics. We've adopted the patient center medical home model. And one of our, our biggest barriers is really getting the patients engaged. You know, we've, we clearly hear the mission, we need to make our patients healthier so they use less health resources. But, you know, it's like you can take a, water, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make them drink. What's your thoughts about using technology to get that patient engagement? Right. So, um, so it's been interesting to me to hear the buzzword of patient engagement come up. And there's also, which has really only been the last, I think, two or three years that it's really become a, a something that people are always asking about. And it's moved, I think, from, a, from kind of a, a token gesture to something that is actually being measured now. Um, in the technology world, there's this similar thing called um, heart metrics. Do, do, who's familiar with heart metrics? So nobody is. So you can't help me with what heart stands for. Um, so it's happiness, engagement, um, adoption, retention, uh, and kind of transaction. I think something like that. Um, but the point is that these are these are these very specific measures that are used by by Google, by Facebook, by any software company um, to understand our are you effectively getting people to your service or product, and are they sticking with it. And it is, you want to think, to look at science, like there is billions of dollars being spent on getting people to be engaged with, their, with that software, with those companies, and to stick with them and to do something at the end. And they do it not because people, the user has to, but because they, they need to get them to want to, right? And it's, this is what I was trying to get at with healthcare. Healthcare has to be thinking that way and using that rule book. And the opportunity to use this rule book that has been so well tested and you know, the fabric of any of our experiences on, in a mobile or, or uh, web environment is, is highly calibrated experiment constantly. We are guinea pigs in a maze, um, or rats in a maze. Um, but but uh, that is the kind of stuff that I think could be leveraged by healthcare, and it's starting to be, and it's starting to be. People, like the, the, the new wave of healthcare companies, I think, um, or digital health companies, the best of them are, and many of them in this room, are thinking in those terms. And then you are playing by the rules that the rest of the, the, rest of the world is, and then you're playing by the rules that, that consumers expect, or people expect in the rest of their lives as consumers, not just patients. Great, I think we have time for maybe one more question. How about from this side of the room? Anybody over there? The shy side of the room? Okay, I saw a few hands over here. Anybody? Great, here, I'll just get back. So, um, I know you, you're probably really into data analytics. Uh, do you have any specific engines you like to run on your um, projects? Any specific engines, like uh, machine learning engines, or? So, so, uh, that's an interesting question. So we don't do any machine learning right now, but we use um, we've we we use lots of databases that don't really work very well, like Parse and Mongo. Um, yeah. There's there's a there's an opportunity for a really good data analytics company in healthcare, if anybody wants to go build that. <laughs> cool. I don't know if that if anybody's understood that. Okay, that was a really quick question. So maybe any, any other questions from the crowd? Please. Denise, do you have that one? Do I, I can hear. Okay. Well, I, I want to be quick because I don't want to, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to stump. But um, uh, so the idea was, so we, we started a website where people, um, we, we, we have reviews about medications from about 100 and more than 100,000 people um, across America, across 500 drugs. And the idea was to start using patient experience as a meaningful um, catalyst to helping people make better decisions. So it's a, anybody, and it was idea, the idea was like, let's build a better WebMD or betterdrugs.com. And what we, what we found was that people are actually coming to the website when they 
are starting a medication or want to switch to a new medication. And that became really interesting to us as a problem because it was clearly a very acute need. And we were offering some help to it, but we were not creating anything that actually helped them with that decision process. It, it helped them kind of get the lay of the land, but it didn't, it didn't take them through a process of evaluation. So that was what the, that's why we designed the app. So we use the, we use clinical guidelines like the PHQ-9 depression test and um, basically just clinical guidelines from the, the American Psychiatrist Association. And we turned it into an algorithm. So it lets people, because importantly, depression is symptomatic, right? So the patient experience is the same thing as the clinical measure. So that is how you measure effect, effect, efficacy of the disease or of, of the um, treatment. So it's a feedback loop between the medicine and the person's experience in order to help, and it does two things. One, it helps people through the side effects, um, which tend to hit early on until the body gets used to the medication. And then it, uh, and so, so for those people who the medicine is going to work, it helps them get through that process. But for if the medicine isn't gonna work for you because of the side effects are enduring or because it, you just don't feel any effect, it gets you I, ideally back to the doctor's office faster. Six weeks is when clinically you should be able to, if you don't see efficacy, effectiveness by then, you should go back to your doctor. So that's kind of the program we created. And that is really a response to this idea that medicine doesn't work. I mean, it, it, we, we know what it works in the lab, in the clinical trials, but when we put it into practice, we don't really measure what's working or what's not very well. Um, again, we can kind of do it in the research umbrella, but we are not measuring the mess. So we wanted to help people measure their own mess, make a better decision, and, and act on accordingly. Well, yeah, so we just, this morning, we launched a, a partnership with a group called Postpartum Progress to help m mothers with um, postpartum depression use the app and try to learn about that experience collectively. So we'll see what happens. It's brand new. All right, let, well, help me in um, thanking Thomas Getz again. All right, well, thank you all so much. I want to welcome everybody again. Um, again, my name is Joe Sam, an executive director of CCMU. It's so great to see so many amazing people here, so many close colleagues and friends. This is by far the biggest turnout we've had at one of our fundraising luncheons. Um, it keeps growing every year, so thank you for your support. Um, I want to also thank a couple special guests in the room. Um, Representative Conti is here, and Representative Josh Joshi, and Representative McCann. If y'all could just raise your hand. Thank you for being here. And uh, our brilliant, um, and I can say brilliant because I know her really well, um, state Medicaid director is here also, Gretchen Hammer, our former executive director. And I'm going to turn it over to Edie Sun, one of our esteemed board members, for um, the next portion of the program. Thank you, Joe. And let me also point out Representative Susan Lantine in the back of the room. I see her here as well. Thank you for being here, Representative. And if we've missed any other elected officials, please accept our apologies. It's hard to, to tell in this really big crowd. So I have the somewhat unenviable position of following Gary's inspiring remarks and Thomas's really thought-provoking comments in that great dialogue that Joe led because the uh, title that Sarah put on my part of the day is a felicitous way of saying that I'm about to ask you for money. So um, get ready for that. Um, as Joe said, I am Edie Sun. I am the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs for Pinnacle Assurance. And even though over the course of the last year I have moved away in my direct professional day-to-day -day context from the health policy issues I've worked on with so many people in this room over the last 25 years, I have not lost my passion for the work that the Co Coalition for the Medically Underserved and many of the other organizations in this room do. 
It's been a great honor for me to have been a board member of CCMU since 2009. And at that time, when I first joined the board, 13.5% of Coloradans were uninsured. And that percentage only rose once the recession hit. As of three weeks ago, though, when we got the latest numbers, that percentage had gone down significantly. Depending on whose figures you use, we are somewhere between 6.7 and 10.3% of Coloradans who lack insurance. Still too many, but such a better picture than we had just six short years ago. We've seen improvement on other measures as well. The number, uh, the rate of Coloradans getting preventive care has increased. The rate of Coloradans having difficulty paying their medical bills has decreased. And maybe most importantly, the percentage of people in our state who say that the healthcare system works for them and for their families is at 75%. We've never seen a number like that. And I think that's another one that deserves a round of applause. Because the improvement in those numbers is due in no small part to the hard work of the individuals and organizations around this room. And I, I want to, I know that the rest of the board and staff of CCMU want to thank each of you for the contributions that you have made. As we said, there's still a lot of work to be done. We must continue to build strong, collaborative relationships among payers, providers, and communities. We need to transform the way we deliver and pay for health care, and we must always, always put the patient first. So that's why I'm here today, and I hope that's why you're here today, too because you believe that Colorado's better when everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy life. And you know it takes all of us working together to achieve that. For 18 years now, oh finally, that's, that's the number Thomas was asking earlier and I couldn't, put my, I couldn't put my finger on it. I should have looked at my notes. For 18 years now, CCMU has worked to create opportunities and eliminate barriers to good health for Coloradans. And I believe that supporting this work is one of the very best investments I can make in securing a healthier future for our state. And let me tell you why. So it might surprise you to learn that CCMU has only seven staff members. It surprises a lot of people to learn that because they are everywhere. They're at the Capitol helping to pass legislation to increase coverage and access to care. They sit on dozens of important boards and committees shaping policy and advocating for health equity. They're in Eagle County supporting community efforts to integrate care, and in La Junta facilitating collaborative health improvement, and in Adams County helping community leaders with workforce planning. And in all of these cases, they are forking the code. They are figuring out what works in those communities, and they are disseminating it to other communities so it can be adapted. And did you know that for the first time ever, Denver's hospital systems, public health, human services, and safety net clinics are meeting together regularly, sharing information, and collaborating to improve health here in Denver. That is a big deal. I mean, we didn't used to see that kind of collaboration. It's a huge step forward. And CCMU's leadership helped make that possible. You've probably seen their award-winning infographics, thank you Sarah Mapes, or read their insightful blog posts, and maybe you've outstanded one of CCMU's outstanding events before today. Uh, I gotta say, even as a board member, I wonder how you guys do it all, I'm, I'm not sure. So earlier this year at CCMU's annual meeting, our good friend Jerry Buckley said, there is no other organization in Colorado that does more with a dollar than CCMU does, and I have to agree with him. CCMU changes lives, and we strengthen communities, and the impact of our work is felt around the state. So, here's my donation envelope. In it is my investment in a healthier Colorado. This investment is in support of all Coloradans having health insurance and access to the healthcare services they need when they need them. It's in support of a healthcare system that meets the needs of patients, families, and communities.
delivering affordable, quality health care. And it's in support of eliminating the health disparities that increasingly divide us. If you'll invest with me, I'm confident we can make a big impact and continue the improvement CCMU has helped to bring about. Now, there are a lot of important, worthy causes out there. And I know we're all asked to, do, to give more often than we can. So if this is not your cause, that's OK. But CCMU is dear to me. And so I'm going to ask that if our issues are issues that you care about, that you make a contribution today. The purchase of your ticket made it possible for us to host this great event in this gorgeous space. But it's what you put in your envelope today that will make it possible for us to continue creating opportunities and eliminating barriers to good health. So our fundraising goal for this event was $100,000. And we're almost there. We've done the math. Well, actually, Sarah and Joe did the math. And if everyone here donated $65, we would reach that goal. We're grateful, of course, for any size donation you can make, um, if you choose to make one today. Each of your tables has a table host, and they have uh, donation envelopes that they will pass out to you. If you don't have donation envelopes, CCMU staff have them. They also have those nifty, handy dandy credit card uh, machines, so that uh, if you don't want to write your credit card number down on the envelope, just find one of them and they can actually run the card for you. So I invite you to take a few minutes to make your contribution now, and then we'll go back up on the trajectory. Joe will come back up and we will announce and honor our champions, uh, our community champion award winners. So thank you again for being here today and for supporting CCMU. All right, we're going to pull it back together here. I'm seeing some people head for the doors, so make sure we stick it out for this part. All right, thank you all. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for your, for your contributions today, your generous contributions. Uh, we're so grateful you're here, that you came to our event. Uh, we're so grateful to have your support as we tackle these hard issues that we, we've talked about today. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank our, our major sponsors of the event, of the event today, Centura Health, uh, Davida, Delta Dental, the Denver Health Foundation, GlaxoSmithKline, SCL Health, Prime Health, the Colorado Trust, and University Physicians, uh, many of whom are in the room today. So thank you again uh, to all our sponsors. We also have a tremendous list of, of supporting sponsors on your agenda that you can, you can reference. So speaking of gratitude, uh, this next part of our agenda is um, one of the best parts of our year at CCMU. Uh, we get to truly, it, it's so special because we get to recognize uh, and thank a few of the truly amazing leaders uh, Colorado is lucky to have. We've been handing out community champion awards at CCMU since our early days, um, since back when I was in high school, alarmingly. <laughs> <laughs> And we've, we've also barely scratched the surface uh, of the deserving leaders across the state. So each year we look at nominees, again, if you look at our agenda, uh, in four categories. Physician of the Year, uh, to honor do the doctors and physicians across the state who are tirelessly committed to caring for the underserved. The Non-Physician Provider of the Year, this is to honor the dozens of other healthcare providers around the state, from nurses, physicians assistants, to EMTs and paramedics, um, that also provide uh, outstanding care, obviously, to our vulnerable populations in our state the advocate of the year uh, to honor the men and women who drive change in our healthcare system every day with their work. And then uh, the truly special one, the Lifetime Achievement Award, which honors an individual who's dedicated their, their life to creating opportunities and eliminating barriers to good health. So we feel the best way to honor these folks is to give them an award, the, what we're presenting today, but also to provide a donation to their organizations uh, or to their life's work so we can support their, their um, you know, all the things that they've been working on over their lives. So our winners this year, all, all of them really sort of exemplify this concept of putting patients first and people first, and they all have gone above and beyond the call of duty uh, that, that their job sort of calls for. They are working to ensure that, all color, all, uh, that good health is available to all Coloradans, and we're so grateful for their hard work and dedication. So here we go. Uh, the physician of the year this year is, is always a tough choice because there's so many amazing physicians around Colorado, uh, many that we know very closely and, and are dear to our hearts. Um, this year's winner has served as a child psychiatrist with the Colorado Psychiatric Access and Consultation for Kids program, CPAC, uh, since its inception, and has helped many children and adolescents who would not otherwise have had access to psychiatric and behavioral health services. We know that mental health care is so difficult to um, come by in rural areas in particular across the state, so it's wonderful that this uh, physician in particular has worked tirelessly visiting rural health clinics, rural health hospitals, consulting with primary care providers and, and promoting solutions that ease access to specialty care. His nominator shared with us that, he belie that she believes his work has improved countless lives and we couldn't agree more. The 2015 Physician of the Year goes to Dr. Fred Michelle of Mental Health Partners. For my little chair, it didn't seem like as many people were here, but it's a lot of you looking this way. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor to receive something like this. I told my wife this, and I said, I've never been a physician of the year. I don't even know if I was ever the physician of the week or the day or anything. So this is pretty cool, and I really want to thank the coalition for recognizing this. One person in the audience said something today that caught my attention, and it kind of rings true for me. They were talking about, as, um, in our discussion section, about you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, which is a truism. I'd often like to add it to that, that, but our job is to make them thirsty. And I hope that that's what's helped you um, make your donations today. It's certainly what's helped me to take kids' work a little bit further. If you can just help a young person get connected to things, if you can help the system want to have it happen, amazing things happen. And the CPAC program has done some amazing stuff for youth in our state who don't have access to child psychiatric care. We do not have many child psychiatrists in this community. If you've ever tried to access even psychiatric care in general, it can take months to get an appointment in this community, in our communities in Colorado, months. And a lot of times our pediatricians are working really hard to bridge that gap, but they need access 
instantly. And the CPAC program gives them, within 30 minutes, a child psychiatrist like myself is calling them and able to answer what really to us is a pretty darn simple question. But to them, it freezes them in their, it's like kryptonite in the office when they have a psychiatric question and they just, they get frozen. And with just a simple phone call of 10 to 15 minutes, I can unfreeze that. It's amazing. And they're moving forward in their day, taking care of kid after kid after kid. So it's a privilege to be part of CPAC, for sure. And it's a privilege to be here today as part of a person recognized for my piece and contribution to the community through the coalition. Thank you very much. I failed to advance the slides earlier. Here's a great bio. We are actually recording this session, so you all will. You can read it later on your, on your computers. Um, great. Or you can read it while I'm talking next. Uh, so our non-physician provider of the year uh, winner is a physician assistant at a Denver area safety net clinic that provides free medical care to our most underserved residents in Denver. In addition to providing excellent care to her patients, she has helped establish a completely free pharmacy, psychological counseling, counseling and labs uh, by partnering with hospitals and recruiting other volunteer providers. Her nominator told us that she even used her own time and money to, and funds to uh, remodel this clinic. Our 2015 Non-Physician Provider of the Year Award goes to Karen Hayes of ACS Community Lift. And Karen, Karen can't be here today, so we welcome Debbie Jackson, the clinic's executive director, to accept her award. Good afternoon. Karen couldn't be here today because she is with her daughter in Boston, so she's asked me to accept this award for her. I said, Karen, can I just say a few words about her? And she told me no, just to, to stick to the script. <laughs> so I guess I won't tell you she is one of the most caring, compassionate people that I know that really care about the medically underserved and is willing to use everything, her resources, everything, to make sure that they are cared and valued for in our clinic. So these are the words from Karen. I am very honored to receive the Colorado Coalition for the Medically Underserved Community Award. This award recognizes the dedication and efforts of all the staff and volunteers at the ACS Left Medical Services Group. We have worked hard over the past year to expand the debe and develop our medical service and focus our patient care on the individual needs of our patients. We have gone from a single small exam room to a suite of five rooms a fully equipped exam room, triage and patient counseling room, medical massage and healing touch room, fully equipped working pharmacy, and mental health counseling office. We have completed our transformation from paper charts to the EMR practice fusion, which has helped us assess the needs of our patients. For example, we have found that over 66% of our patients are diabetic. Every patient now receives a glucometer if they do not have one, test strips, lancets, medication, glucometer instruction, and individual diabetes education focusing on diet and exercise. All of this has provided us with the ability to develop our medical services for each individual patient, providing them access to affordable medical wellness and preventive health care. Again, thank you very much for this honor. I swear I pushed that dang button to go forward. Okay, I'm just gonna do this first. Okay, great. So this year we had a, an overwhelming number of nominations for our Advocate of the Year Award, which you do every year, which is great because it affirms what we already know and it, uh, that it means there's a lot of hardworking leaders across the state uh, really driving change in their communities and healthcare. However, it makes it really difficult to pick a winner. Um, so this, our winner this year comes all the way from the Roaring Fork Valley um, out near the, uh, Glenwood Springs. And she's a care coordinator and health coach. Uh, we're told her advocacy for the Latina community, the assistance she provides for um, medically complex Medicaid patients, and her community engagement strategies are second to none, quote unquote. She reduces patient barriers while reducing cardiovascular disease. Um, and her nominator shared that her, her authenticity and openness come straight from her heart, saying she has enormous passion and gives others hope. The 2015 Advocate of the Year Award goes to Veronica Morales of M Mountain Family Health Centers.
I'm trying to imagine this as a dream, really, because I said I was going to write a speech, and then I said, you know, I, I, I try not to make it sound too scripted or too perfect. I'm like, should have brought my lightsaber with me. Um, <laughs> am I the only one? Yeah, okay. Um, I said, you know what? Um, I'm just going to wing it. I, I've, I've come to learn that when I wing it, it's brilliant. So. <laughs> And I'm not going to cry because this eyeliner took a really long time. So, <laughs> whew. Anyways, I um, am truly honored um, to receive this award, to just be listed, nominated, and, and just um, announced with the rest of these amazing group of people is um, just, I can't, as you can see, I'm speechless. Um, I am very passionate about what I do. And I am so thankful every day that I get to go do what I, what I, what I feel I do best. Um, I like to give a special thanks to um, a very special individual that's not here today. Um, I like to call him my Yoda. That's um, Ken Davis. And he has just been an, an amazing inspiration and mentor to me. I also want to give a special thanks to my gentle spirit, Jolene, who's here today. And to my friend, an amazing inspiration, Deaf Center. Um, I am really excited to go back to Mount Family Health Centers and continue to do the work that I do and bring others along um, on this amazing journey. And I, I can't wait for what the future holds, not just for me, but I feel very honored and privileged to um, be allowed to be a witness um, in my clients' stories and um, help them there greatly um, because, like I tell them, I'm just like you. So, thank you. We had tears flowing at our annual meeting for those who were at the annual meeting this year too. So something about these events bring, <laughs> brings, to the, brings to the heart. Um, so finally, we have our Lifetime Achievement Award. It takes a very special person with decades of experience and an exceptional dedication to the underserved to be nominated in this category. And yet year after year, we find ourselves torn uh, between a number of truly iconic figures in Colorado, all of whom have made outstanding commitments to our state. This year, our winner is also someone I'm proud to count as a, a personal hero of mine, and I consider him a mentor. Um, a longtime advocate and tireless voice for the underserved, particularly African Americans in Denver. He has run many effective disease prevention, insurance enrollment, and care entry programs that have changed the lives of so, so many. He's a sought after thought leader as a member of countless boards and commissions across Colorado, including the Blue Ribbon Commission for Healthcare Reform, the Metro Denver Health and Wellness Commission, and the Board of the Colorado Health Foundation. He made his mark early in his career with something that's very near to my heart in community development work and in churches and faith based movements. Um, and he's been doing this work year in and year out for over 30 years. His nominator says the best 80% uh, of life is showing up, and by that measure alone, Grant has been highly effective in our community, a calm, consistent, persistent, and eloquent voice for change. As he prepares to retire, we are so happy to be able to honor him this year for his body of work uh, with our Lifetime Achievement Award, Grant Jones from the Center for African American Health. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe, thank you. Uh, it's, um, it's a very special honor for me to receive this award uh, in general, but in, in particular special because of who's giving it. I, I'm a big fan of CCMU. Uh, I know firsthand in community how highly regarded they are, how effective their advocacy work is how important it is. So I, I am really grateful for that 
reason in particular. I, I, I want to just say a few words of thanks, and then I want to leave you. I want to be on a soapbox for about 30 seconds and leave you with something that I want to encourage you about. So uh, I am the founder uh, and the executive director of the Center for African American Health. Our, our work is dedicated to improving the health and well-being of the African American community. And I started the Center for African American Health on a powerful inspiration, but it, I didn't do it by myself. And some of you know, as Joe has mentioned, that I'm, I'm going to be leaving the center at the end of this calendar year. And in fact, I made that announcement to my board about this time last year. And, uh, you know, so in my transition, uh, I'm having some of the feelings now in the home stretch that are a bit bittersweet. But there's something about transition that invites you to another opportunity. And for me, the invitation has been to reflect on the journey with the center. And when I look back on the journey and the distance we've traveled, I, I feel proud of the work at some level, but I especially feel grateful for um, all that have joined hands with me all, along the way. So a, an outstanding staff, an extraordinary board of directors, you know, an exceptional number of volunteers and, and great partners in community like CCMU. And so I felt lifted up um, and inspired by all of that kind of support. And in fact, in, in this moment, I guess what I'm feeling is uh, blessed. Uh, I, I feel blessed to receive this award from, from CCMU and a um, special uh, embrace and uh, good feeling about the leadership of CCMU, your board members and Gretchen and others that I know. So thank you so much for this. And what I want to leave you with is, um, I know that all, if not most of you, are involved in work that has to do with encouraging the improvement of health for others. But I want to leave you with a, an admonition, if you will. Please treasure your health. So thank you so much. All right, well, I think we've arrived at the end. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank Thomas Getz again as our speaker for coming out from San Francisco. I'd also like to ask all of our current board members to please stand so we can thank them for their leadership and dedication to CCMU. And Larry, can you remain standing, please? I also want to acknowledge a really special person in the crowd today, uh, Dr. Larry Keefe, one of CCMU's founders. Um, he ended his tenure as a board member in May, and so we want to thank him for coming in and for his service to CCMU. Uh, it would also be ridiculous to take credit for any of this event, so I want to th thank the staff at CCMU uh, for their hard dedication, especially um, Sarah Mc McAfee and uh, Katie Bain, uh, our communications team. All right, so thank you, thank you for coming again. Uh, we have evaluations on the table. If you could please fill those out, we'd be so grateful. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next year at our event. <laughs>